Okay, uh, it's 10 o'clock in Germany, so it's time to start our uh, fourth webinar of the mobile mapping series. Uh, my name is Yoni Salo, I'm a support and training engineer in the Land Mobile Support Group here in Biberach, Germany. Uh, I'm also joined by uh, my colleague Miguel Parra, uh, who is helping me with organizing this, this webinar. And also we have Chembe Chisense from Applanix, who will help us if there's hard questions we cannot answer in the end. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, the topic of today is getting the best out of Postback part two. Uh, so let's start with a small recap on the what we have done so far in the webinar series. So we started the series on, uh, I think it was June. And uh, the first topic was uh, factors which influence the uh, accuracy of mobile mapping. Uh, the second, second was done in August by Miguel. Uh, it was about uh, doing registration of uh, point cloud in TPC, uh, specifically for MX9 system. Then last month we had a first session of this uh, postback series, part one, where where Vincent and Carl uh, talked about uh, different method methods of post processing in postback. And now this this series is a kind of a follow up for that one. So we will keep talking about postback and actually all of the uh, webinars so far have discussed in a way accuracy stuff. So so this has been the, like the main topic of the first four webinars. Uh, goal of this presentation is to uh, help you to understand how to make best choices in Postback. Uh, we are going to talk about different aiding sensors like GAMS and DMI and some settings. And in the end, we want to help you understand the, uh, the effect of different settings and different sensors and help you to get the best out of your, your mobile mapping system. Uh, Okay, a uh, little bit about the agenda of today. Uh, first, I'm going to show you in a couple slides uh, two different kinds of plots we get out of Postback, because we are going to use these plots later in the in the uh, presentation to explain you the effect of GAMS and DMI. Then we are going to jump into GAMS, uh, what it is, uh, what uh, what is the effect of using GAMS, how we should use it, and what is the correct way to calibrate GAMS. Uh, then we talk about DMI, uh, same topics as with the GAMS, so how does it affect our data, how we should use it, in which cases we should or should not use it, and how is the calibration uh, done properly for DMI. Then we have a couple settings we want to show you Quickly, uh, multipath setting is one of them, and initialization modes are the second uh, topic about settings we want to talk about. Then we have a short summary uh, about what we covered, and in the end, we hope we have uh, at least 10 or 15 minutes to answer your questions. So in the in this go to webinar platform, you have a. Uh, way to ask questions for us. We will see the questions. We are not going to answer them during the webinar, but in the end, we will answer them. And if there are some questions we cannot answer right away, we we will get back to you after the webinar. OK. So let's go to interpreting the plots. So today, uh, we're going to show you two main types of plots. First. Uh, of them is the RMS plots, and the RMS plots actually show us the estimated quality of a certain solution. So we have one data set, and uh, we want to estimate the quality of this data set with this plot. Another plot is the difference in two calculated solutions. So we have the actual solution, what we call SBET in the postback, and we compare two uh, 
actual differences. So we have X, Y, Z and so on, and we can compare the difference in these two. To explain a little further the RMS plots, uh, we have one data set. We calculate the position at point in time, X, Y, Z, using a uh, combination of different satellites. Then we actually calculate the position in the same point in time, but with different combinations of satellites. And as we have some redundancy on the on the satellites, we might have up to 20 to 30 satellites. We can do this. And uh, when we have multiple different uh, so solutions or, or results from these combinations, we can get RMS at this point in time. And then we just advance to next. Uh, point in time and do the same calculations again and so on and in the end we end up with the graph where we have a, a RMS value in meters in the x-axis and time in the y-axis You will see some examples later The second plot we want to want to uh, Show you today is the different plots this in prospect is called navdif some of you might be familiar with this one uh, so there we have two final solutions, SBETs. We take the actual position or orientation from SBET number one at certain point in time. Uh, then we take the other, another SBET, we take the same point in time, but we took take uh, the maybe different uh, position or orientation at this time, and we just simply calculate the position difference so x y z and so on and then we do it for all the points in the time uh, and 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 again we end up with the graph with uh, uh, the difference in the y-axis and time in the x-axis okay you will see some uh, examples later so try to keep this in mind so Let's go to the first actual topic about GAMS. So what is GAMS? GAMS is a GNSS azimuth measurement system. So in short, we can say GAMS. So you see the picture in the right, we have a MX2 system here. Uh, there's some primary antenna on top of the MX2 pod, but we actually have a second GNSS antenna in the front. And this second antenna is called the GAMS antenna. Uh, why we use GAMS? There are uh, multiple advantages in, in setting up the GAMS. Uh, the first one is that we can get faster heading initialization in the field. Uh, we, and when we get this faster heading initialization, not always we need to do this uh, special driving maneuvers, like uh, for example, driving the figure eight in a parking lot or stuff like this. Uh, and of course, this will re reduce the time we need to complete our mission. Also, GAMS will help us to recover after GNSS outage. And some of the cases where we want to use GAMS, uh, especially with low performance IMUs, so the systems which don't have the high end IMUs, I would say this is uh, at least MX7 and MX2 in our portfolio which have AP15 and AP20 IMU or INS systems. Also, you might want to use GAMS when you have a project where you need a quick initialization. So maybe you have a limited time you can spend on the, on the site you are mapping. Uh, also, if you have projects where you have to stop frequently and for some reason you don't have DMI uh, in, the, in the system, you might want to use GAMS in this case. And the fourth, uh, fourth uh, time when you might need to use GAMS is when you have a project where you need to drive slow or with few dynamics. Uh, project where you might have a few dynamics is, for example, a railway project where we have a constant speed and we don't have very sharp uh, turns or accelerations. So we are going quite uh, with steady uh, steady speed and not, not many turns or accelerations. So that could be a case where you want to use GAMS. Okay. Uh, then I will compare uh, two different 
uh, uh, topics. So uh, first we have a GAM setup with no error, and then I will show you what happens when we have GAM setup with some error in the lever arms. So lever arms are, in short, the vector between the two antennas. So the primary antenna on top of the system and the GAMS antenna or secondary antenna in the front of the system. Uh, we have to know the lever arms or the vector between these in the coordinate system we have defined. Uh, you can see it here on the left. So we have a positive x-axis in the direction of the vehicle driving uh, direction. We have z-axis which is positive to down. Uh, so towards the ground and we have y-axis which is positive to right side of the car if you look from the back and we have in this case uh, with the error we have a error in in the y lever arm in the plus direction this is uh, 10 degrees off which is quite extreme uh, case but we want to exaggerate this so you can see the difference well so this 10 degree uh, uh, offset would mean that the system is rotated in clockwise direction. So of course, if we have an error-free GAMS lever arm setup, uh, we don't have any issues. We have a nice clean data set. For example, here we see how the MX9 scans. So the green scanning line is, is what the left scanner delivers us and red uh, scanning line is what the right scanner de delivers us. We get good alignment between the two scanners in the building walls. But if we have a case which I showed, so we have a error in the Y lever arm of the GAMS, we end up with something like this. So the as as the system is rotated in clockwise clockwise direction, uh, we get some offset between the two scanners. So the red wall you can see here uh, in the up and down, uh, it will be different than the green wall. And the red, red wall is from the right scanner and the green wall is from the left scanner. So we end up with offset uh, in perpendicular to the driving distance, but also you can see that we have some offset as well in the parallel to the driving direction. So if you see a phenomena like this in your data uh, from top view, for example, you might have to consider that there might be something wrong with your GAM setup. So if, you, if we put it more simple way, what happens with the left scanner, the street gets more narrow and it's rotated in a clockwise direction. And with the right scanner, uh, the street gets wider and it's also rotated in the clockwise direction. So what we have up here is shifted forward and what we have down here is shifted backwards. So this is a good thing to keep in mind. And if you see something like this in the data, you should uh, maybe play with your GAMS a little bit. And if we see something like this, we might need to do a GAMS calibration. Uh, we have actually four different methods how to calibrate the GAMS. Uh, the first one uh, is the most, which the leaves most error. And when we go down from one to two to three to four, we get more precise uh, alignment for the GAMS. But in most cases, we cannot do all of them. So these are optional. Uh, we might just do one and two or one and three, but you should keep in mind that you should not do like you do number four first and then you go back to number one because this will give you more error. So you, you should do this in order, but you don't need to do all of this. I'm gonna go in the detail about what these calibrations are in a minute. So uh, the first method what we actually pretty much always do is the raw, raw estimation of the GAMS lever arm. And this is quite simple. You just measure with the tape, uh, measure, measure, measurement the position of the second antenna with relation to the primary antenna. So you just take the center points of the both antennas and you try to measure the vectors, so the X and the Y and the Z. 
here we have two examples. Uh, in the left, we have MX2, the primary antenna is here in the top of the pod, and the uh, secondary antenna is here in the front. So in this case, the X could be, for example, two meters positive, and the Z could be five centimeters positive, and the Y is usually zero if it's set up in the same rigid frame. The same thing with the MX7 on the right. Uh, so we have this reference pin in the bottom of the uh, quick release blade of the MX7, and then we just measure the distance from this pin to the center point of the antenna here in the front. So this is quite simple, and it's enough to get this in couple centimeter accuracy, what you can achieve with the tape measurement, of course. If you can use total station or even laser scanner to measure this, it's the better. So we want to get some kind of estimate from the from the this raw measurement. And then we have some ways how we can uh, refine this to uh, be more accurate. The second method is something called on-site calibration with LV PostView. Uh, LV POS view is the interface to the Aplanix POS system. Actually, if you use MX9 or MX7, you will not be familiar with LV POS view as this is operating behind the TMI interface we use in these systems. But if you have some of the older systems like MX2 or MX8, you might be familiar with the LV POS view. And in this in this uh, interface, you have a tool to calibrate the GAMS. I will not go into detail about this, this one, but if you have uh, MX2 or MX8, uh, you can find this POS-LV version 5 installation and operation guide, and you can, you can find this procedure from there. Then method 3 is uh, a method where we can refine the lever arms actually in the post pack, so in the post processing phase. So in this case, we need some kind of estimate from the field, like we did in the method one. We put this, or we use this in the beginning in the uh, post pack, but we change the standard deviation to unknown. So this means that we give some space for the uh, lever arm to move. Of course, we want to get, uh, if, we, we, if we do this, we need a good data set with no GNSS gaps. So we can trust this solution coming out of, out of this tool. Uh, then we run the forward processing. Then we go to the plots and we have something under calibrated installation parameters, which is called Y GAMS lever arm. And actually, because we gave it post back the freedom to calibrate this lever arm, we can see that we started from around 0 0.04, but postback is in the end of the time giving us value of 0 0.029. So we started from uh, 0 0.043 and we end up with 0 0.029. So there is a little bit over one centimeter difference in the Y arm from this calibration method. Then you just take this value, you put it again here. So uh, replace the old value, you set the standard deviation to 5 centimeters, and then you can do run all processing, so calculate the final solution. And also you can do this in a kind of iteration way, so you run again with unknown and see if it's still changing, so you can end up with the uh, value you can trust. And why we don't put this to 1 centimeter is the reason that if we put this to 1 centimeter Postback will give more weight to the GAM solution. And this, this actually depends on the system you're using, if you should do this or not. The method four is something what is quite work heavy. And this is refining the Y lever arm by matching left and right scans. So this means you have to generate a scan, then you do a new postback processing, then you generate a scan again and you see how uh, how the data changes. So in this in this method, we want to find a vertical a wall which is parallel to the driving direction. So we in this case we have to drive here and we are checking this vertical wall here in the left. 
and we see how the misalignment in the between the two scans is changing. So we just uh, change the y y axis in postback, then we always generate a new scan and we try to observe how the y value is changing the data. Uh, I will show the next slide. You can see a bit more uh, better how how it's affecting the data. So in first we have a GAMS Y level arm of uh, one centimeter positive, and you can see there's quite a huge difference. This maybe ten centimeters between the scans. Then we have three centimeters positive. It's a little bit better, but still not. I wouldn't be happy with this. But when we refine it to millimeter level uh, 0 0.032, so 3.2 centimeters positive direction, we are finally happy with the data. So all of the scans are overlaid nicely. So actually, if you want to be very precise with the GAMS, you need to calibrate it to one millimeter level. But I have to say this is regarding a system with the high precision IMU. So this is actually MX9 data where the millimeter level uh, difference is consider considerable. Okay. Okay. Also, there are some cases where you should not use GAMS, and this is when we have these two conditions reunited. So we have a high-end IMU, so we have AP50 or AP60. In some cases, maybe also AP40. And we have poor genus conditions. So in this case, uh, you should at least compare the result with or without GAMS and see it yourself if it's uh, if it makes sense to use GAMS or not. And this is quite tricky because there's no definite answer if it's if it should be used or not. It's really case by case because there's so many factors which influence the accuracy of your solution. But I, I can show you an example of a, of a data set. Uh, so here we have a data with GAMS and without GAMS, but we don't have any GNS outage, so we have a good solution. And as you can see, there's, there's actually no difference in the data, so it doesn't make any difference if you, you, if you are using GAMS or not, if you have no GNS outage. And this is, again, this MX9 data, so we are having high-end IMU. But then we, when we have an outage, you can actually see that with GAMS we have first solution than without GAMS. And again, this is MX9 data, so we have a really precise IMU in the in the system, and we should, in this case, trust this, uh, uh, IMU to give the heading of the system, not the GAMS. So this is something if you have a high-end system and you are using GAMS, you should. Uh, check your data if you see a phenomenon like this, and then you should make the setting change in uh, in the post pack accordingly. So uh, to conclude, the GAMS uh, we can uh, we can put it into this table. So we have three cases: we have GAMS, uh, no GAMS data. We have uh, GAMS Y lever arm, what we got out of calibration in postback, and we have GAMS Y lever arm we got out of uh, matching the left and right point class. Then we can also calculate the solution with standard deviation of one centimeter, so there's more weight for the GAMS, or we can calculate a solution with the standard deviation of five centimeters, so there's not as much weighting for the GAMS solution. And actually, this is a calibration data set, and we don't calibrate the MX lines with GAMS, so we get quite good solution between the mismatching of the of the uh, planes uh, with no GAMS, uh, and there's not a big difference between uh, if we use the standard deviation five centimeters between the different uh, cases. The worst case is when we use the final value of the calibrated installation. Uh, 
from the final value from the plot and the, we put standard deviation one centimeter that's the worst case in this test but again this is case by case but this is just to give you some idea of the effect of GAMS in your data okay next we're going to talk about the DMI uh, DMI is short for distance measurement instrument or sometimes I also hear uh, distance measuring indicators I think both are correct both are correct terms uh, so DMI is uh, like what we see in the right, it's a device we attach to the usually to the rear wheel of the car. It measures accurate uh, velocity and accurate covered distance of the vehicle. It gives us roughly, uh, I think it's 4,096 uh, 4, pulses per rotation, so we get quite precise data here. Uh, cases when we want to use DMI. Actually, there's no case where we should not use DMI. DMI will always help us, even with uh, good conditions. But especially when we have poor GNS environment, we will benefit from DMI quite a lot. Also, when you have a data uh, or, or you have a mission where you have a frequent long stops, let's say a urban, urban environment, then you will benefit from using DMI. What DMI does? Uh, in addition to giving us accurate distance and accurate velocity, it also stabilizes the IMU drift in the real-time solution while we are standing still. And it also uh, gives us zero update uh, velocity information during post-processing. So it gives, uh, it tells us accurately when we are not moving at all. Uh, GNS and IMU will not give us this information as they are a little bit drifting always. So this is the only device which can actually tell us that we are not moving at all. Okay. Uh, to compare uh, how using DMI versus no DMI, uh, how it affects the data, we did a little test. I want to thank uh, Vincent, our colleague, for uh, preparing this test. Uh, we had this kind of data set. Uh, this is the trajectory. Uh, so uh, we had five passes to both directions here in this big road in the middle. Uh, and uh, we had targets here in this area. There's a zoom, zoom location of targets. So we had, uh, we had uh, how many targets we have? <laughs> 14. 14 targets in total, so we have quite good uh, redundancy in the in the test. So we have multiple results. Uh, then we also, as this is quite good GNS environment here, we did an artificial GNS outage to test. So we always split GNS satellites in this area, so we can compare data with without outages and with outages. So this was quite a nice test to show the effect of DMI. Uh, this data is coming from an MX8 system. This has POS-LV420 system. So it's maybe you could say it's a mid-range uh, product, not as precise as AP60, but still in the higher end. Uh, duration of the outages in this area previous, previously shown is they were between 70 to 150 seconds. So from one minute to two and a half minutes, so quite actually quite long outages. Uh, the targets we used for uh, for comparing were like this seen here in the data. So small uh, squares. Uh, and what we compared in, in this test, we compared the position RMS values. So this is the plot I, sh uh, I explained in the beginning. We can also see some statistics. So we can see RMS, we can see the mean value, minimum and maximum. And also we can compare the position difference between uh, two solutions. And for this, we can also see RMS value, 
mean value, minimum, and maximum. Uh, so as we measured all, all targets five times, we can calculate the standard deviation of these five measurements. We can calculate the max different, maximum delta or maximum difference between two targets. And this was actually a relative test, so we don't have the actual absolute position for these targets, but we can see how much there's a, how spread these targets are from each other, and if DMI affects this. So this is not uh, in this test. Unfortunately, we don't have data about the absolute accuracy, but we know how much better the DMI does uh, makes the relative accuracy of the data. So how well do different uh, passes match each other. Okay. So we had uh, four cases. We had cases without DMI and with DMI. And we have cases without GNSS outage and we have case with GNSS outage. And we compare again position difference with and without. We show the calculated RMS. We take a screenshot. Uh, we show the measured standard deviation between the targets. And we also give the max relative shift between the furthest away targets. OK, then the results. So first we have a case uh, with no outage and the position difference between using DMI and without DMI. So here we can see that we have some differences in the solution when using DMI and without DMI. The RMS value uh, is roughly one centimeter for all, all uh, X, Y, and Z. So it's not major, but something you might want to consider. Uh, the mean is very, very low in millimeters. In minimum, we have a spike of a uh, little bit over, a little bit less than eight centimeters in, in minimum, and maximum is a little bit less than five centimeters. So there are some differences, but nothing very high. Uh, when we look at the targets, we can see that in the area with the targets without outage, the standard deviation between the targets is only uh, two, centi two centimeters roughly, and uh, maximum difference between two targets in XYZ was a little bit less than six centimeters. And as you can see, with DMI and without DMI, there was no difference at all. So we can we could say that uh, when you have no outages, there's DMI doesn't give any major uh, influence. Maybe the spikes you saw in the previous previous slides there are maybe places where you turn around or there's a, a short, very short. Uh, versus solution, but in, in, in general, there's no big difference between the two cases. But then we have a data with outages. So there we, we, we will see a much bigger uh, difference. So you can see the scale here in the left, it changes quite dramatically. So a uh, spike here, for example, is up to 40 centimeters and down here up to uh, over 25 centimeters. The RMS values, uh, in general, they are uh, around four centimeters for X, Y, and two centimeters for down. Uh, the mean value is not that big again because we still have some areas without outages. So we have outages only in the, probably in the areas where we have the spikes in the plot. But the minimum and the maximum values are quite quite big, especially especially for the X and Y, because uh, DMI will always help us most with the X, y, X and Y, not that much with the Z. So uh, there's quite dramatic change or quite dramatic difference. Uh, when we look at the targets for without DMI uh, data without edges. We have standard deviation of roughly 30 centimeters 
in XYZ. And the maximum difference between two targets in 3D distance was over one meter, so quite quite high. But again, these were outages over over two minutes. But with DMI, our standard deviation goes down roughly 30%, and also our maximum uh, difference between two targets goes down roughly uh, 36%. So it's uh, we could say it's a uh, one-third better solution with DMI and this is quite quite dramatic change so we could say from this that it's if you have data with outages as we usually have in uh, in mobile mapping it's worth using DMI we also have some ways to improve the DMI calibration so as we had with uh, GAMS we also for DMI we need to know the lever arms and this we we can again roughly measure the X, Y, and Z from uh, from the uh, reference point of your system with the tape uh, measurer or even total station if it's possible or laser scanner. But in addition to the lever arms, we have something called scale factor. Scale factor is calculated by uh, the measurement rate divided by uh, two times p time radius uh, for for our mobile mapping systems. Uh, for MX7 and MX9, you don't need to do this calculation yourself because this is calculated in, in background in the TMI software. So we are just asked uh, we are we are just asking you the radius of your wheel, and then we calculate it in the background. Then for the scale factor, we also have a sign so it's positive on the if the dmi is mounted on the left side of your car and negative if it's on the right side of your car uh, we can use uh, the same calibration method in postback as we did for the gams for the dmi for the lever arms it's not as good as for the gams especially for the cz vector but for the scale factor we can uh, get quite good results in post-processing also. So what we would do, uh, we would first uh, go into the settings. We go to DMI. Uh, we have here the scale factor uh, window. Uh, we put the standard deviation to 100%. So we let the value change 50% from the original, so 50% minus. 50% plus, but we need to have some kind of uh, starting estimate here. So what we measured in the field. Uh, then we just run forward processing. Then again, we go to the plots, calibrated installation parameters, and there we have a DMI scale factor. Here we see it changed it from 2000 to 2095. We take this value, we put it again here, then we can run again, and we can repeat this until the change is not considerable. Usually one iteration will be enough. And uh, this is the way we can uh, calibrate the DMI scale factor. And now you might ask, what is the effect of wrong DMI scale factor? So we took an example of uh, DMI scale factor, which is wrong, 7.8%. Uh, so we have 413 instead of 383.3. And here we get, uh, in this data set, we get not that big difference, but uh, in some spikes, we have difference from minus 1.6 centimeters up to one centimeter so we can say it's maybe considerable but uh, not huge difference okay that's it about dmi if you have questions use the question tool again and we try to answer after the presentation i have a couple more slides left uh, i want to talk about multipath setting and initialization settings or uh, different initialization modes we have in postback so the multipath setting uh, i explained the multipath 
phenomena in the first webinar. So if you need refreshing, maybe you can try to find if you have a recording of this. But uh, multipath is something where we have echoes and this uh, obstructions in the GNS signal. So we have a conflict of uh, information in the receiver. Uh, if you want to use the multipath setting, you have to estimate yourself what is the level of this obstruction for the GNS signal. And for the multipath, we have three options. So if you think that you had good GNS coverage, maybe you had a mission in the highway with fields around, no, no obstacles for the GNS signals, you could use the low setting. But when you have, when you're uh, doing a mission in uh, let's say urban area or or uh, area with trees, you might want to use medium or high options. And what this setting does is actually changes the weighting of GNSS and IMU in the Kalman filter. So if we put high uh, multipath, we will rely more on the IMU. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, also multipath, there might be cases that uh, you did a mission in high multipath environment. And I think this setting is in default and medium. And you, for some reason you cannot process the data until the end, you might want to try to change this to high and see if the uh, processing goes until the end. So this is also a troubleshooting tip that if you have issues, with getting a result from or solution from Postback, you can try to change this setting. <coughs> okay, that's about multipath. Uh, a little bit about the different initialization modes we have available. This is a window you can see in the GNS inertial processor settings in Postback. We have a GNSS track heading. Uh, so this calculates the initial attitude from Genesis track angle. <clears throat> this is only usable when, when our system speed is at least two meters per second. Uh, second option is GAMS compass. Uh, this is only available if we used GAMS. Uh, then we have a gyro compassing. Uh, this is a default option when you, uh, and it's the uh, heading from the IMU. And especially when we have a high-end IMU, we want to use this one. And the last one is something called the VNAV Attitude Solution. Uh, this is actually the real-time solution calculated on the field. And we can use this one to get the initial heading. Uh, the VNAV is mostly a troubleshooting uh, option in case we had a bad on the field initialization. I will explain this a bit more in the next slide. Uh, so the effect of different initialization modes. If we did the initialization according to the recommended procedure of Trimble or Atlantix, so we have a static logging and we have a dynamic logging of data. In the beginning, in a good GNSS environment, there's actually no major differences between different modes. But in many cases, for some reason, maybe the system driver did not know how to do proper initialization or if there was a, you were forced to do initialization in bad environment or in a way which is not recommended by us, there might be some differences between different modes. So, for example, the difference between gyro compassing, so the default option and the VNAV mode is sometimes considerable. Uh, in this case, uh, VNAV will give you the start of the SPET solution earlier, but the gyro compassing will give you a better solution. Uh, so this is, uh, as I said in previous slide, if you have a case like we sometimes see that there was no good initialization done and you start recording data, but your SBET is not covering your recorded data, you might want to try uh, Redo, you might want, want to redo the postback processing and change the initialization mode to uh, Vina, and you might get those couple extra seconds more in the start of your SBET, which might cover, cover your data better. 
Also, there's an option that you can skip if you if you know that you were forced to start the mission in bad environment, you can skip some uh, data from the beginning of the mission. There's a timing setting available in the in the processing options of Postback. Okay, we are getting closer to finishing the webinar. Uh, just to uh, give a short summary, so GAMS is the secondary antenna we can use for, as an aiding sensor for our system. It decreases our initialization time and it increases heading accuracy, especially for low-end IMUs. For high-end IMUs, you have to be uh, careful and evaluate case by case if it's useful for you or not. And if you're not sure, you can always send us an email and we will we will help you figure out if it's useful for you or not. Uh, DMI, uh, it increases the overall accuracy in especially hard genus conditions, but it's always useful to use. And it decreases the IMU drift during stops. And we also showed you the way to get best out of your system using correct DMI settings. Then I covered a couple, couple extra settings, so multipath. It's a uh, multipath setting is helping you in a hard genesis environment and the different initialization modes you can uh, use for troubleshooting in case of bad initialization. Okay, I think that's it from my side. Uh, we are on the time, so we have roughly 15 minutes to answer your questions. Uh, here are some resources. So what we used to uh, uh, build this uh, uh, presentation. So we used, uh, of course, Postback Manual, uh, PostLV uh, Guide, DMI and CAMS uh, guides. So you might want to also check this if you have questions. And uh, next webinar, actually, it's not yet decided what is the topic, what we, but we still try to do webinar every one month. And of course, if you have good ideas, what you want to hear, you can feel free to recommend us a topic. But uh, just follow your email and uh, you will see an invite for the next webinar later. Thank you from my side so far. Uh, Miguel is here helping me with the questions and uh, I will also unmute Jembe from Applanix now so Jembe can also participate answering to the questions if necessary. Okay, thank you Johnny for the presentation, very useful information for our users and we are very happy that we have quite a lot of questions to answer and we will start first with what does SBED stand for? Okay. Yeah, this was explained maybe in the first uh, webinar, so it's a good, good thing to refresh. So SBET is the final solution we get from Postback. It's short for uh, Smoothed Best Estimated Trajectory. So it's the final uh, path what the vehicle traveled in the field. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you for the question, Jan Visser. Another question regarding the calibration methods of the uh, lever arms for GAMS. Mm -hmm. uh, user is interested to know if any combination of them is recommended or they can use it separately. Yeah, it depends a little bit uh, on the, uh, the system you have. Uh, I will scroll back to the slide. One minute. Where are we? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I will show this one. Okay, so I would always start with the number one. So you always want some kind of estimate for your lever arm from the field. But then it's up to you how to, how what, what of the rest you want to use. I would say one and three are the most normal case. Number two, you can only use with MX2 and MX8 at the moment. Uh, number four, 
it's only usable when you have a system with dual laser scanners, so MX9, MX2, MX8, if you have an older system. So it depends on your, on your system, what, what is the best way to calibrate this one or what, what you can even do. But one and three are available for every system, I would say. Okay, thank you, Johnny. Uh, another question that is very important regarding the GAMS and the recommendations we do to don't use GAMS. Uh, the question is, do you refer to don't use GAMS on, in the field or in the post-processing? In the post-processing always. So in the field, it's always good to use GAMS so you get a quick real-time initialization, but the, but the main question is if, if to use GAMS on the post-processing or not. Okay, good. Thank you. I hope it's clear this answer and also related with GAMS. Uh, why we are recommending to use GAMS for our MX9 users and which is the benefit to have it? Uh, I think we mentioned I, it in the presentation. Yeah, I, I can show just to slide. So we get faster he heading initialization uh, on the field, uh, which will reduce, reduct our mission time. Uh, and when, if we, if you don't use DMI, we would advise maybe to use GAMS. But especially if you have an application where you drive slow or you drive with few dynamics, then GAM, well calibrated GAMS would be beneficial for MX9 as well. But as, as MX9 has very high end IMU, uh, it's very case by case question. And if you're not sure, we can discuss this uh, via email also. Okay, thank you. And to finalize maybe the question, what will be the benefit to have the DMI? So now we have clear the benefits of using GAMS and why it's recommended to use it while collecting data on the field. Yeah. And what will be your answer for the benefits of DMI? So DMI will, because we work on the land mobile, so of course these slides they also only consider land mobile applications. Uh, we always have some issues with GNSS uh, visibility because of course, if you map only in the desert or in the fields, yeah, maybe you're fine. But uh, in most cases, we drive to forest area or we drive to area with buildings which block our GNSS. And DMI will always help in this in these cases. So, uh, especially in the X Y accuracy. Okay. So thank you for the answer, Johnny. And another question regarding the DMI, uh, does it matter on which side of the car we mount the, the No, it, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think some people uh, try to mount it on the side, which is not next to the uh, road side. So if you park your car, you will be more safer, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, only thing you have to be careful that you put the correct sign for your scale factor according to the site where you mount the DMI. And I think I will add that it's important to have this set up in the DMI software. Yes, Once, yeah. So you decide left or right, but it has to be checked on the DMI software. Yeah, correct. Uh, regarding the um, measuring of the lever arms, when we said roughly measure, what does the roughly means? You mentioned about a uh, tape measurement. Yeah. So I would say <laughs> centimeters. Yeah, a couple yeah. Of centimeters is okay. But uh, of course, if you if it's possible to measure this with a more precise device like total station or whatever, it's always better. But let's say a couple centimeters is still okay. Uh, we have another question here. Can you process data from Novatel? I mean, in Postpack? I guess to my knowledge, no. no? Maybe we Maybe can have the... Chende can comment. Um, the most important thing also is basically the format uh, of the data. You know, can you import the data in Postback? Is uh, the format recognizable? I think that's uh, one of the most important things. Yeah. But I would assume no, probably. No. No. At least the standard format. Yeah. 
check. Okay, so we have still some minutes yeah. to get more answers, so please take advantage of that. Yeah, I will show also here the our email from the last slide. So in case you have a long question, which you feel needs more time to <laughs> prepare asking us and you might need a longer answer, just send an email to imaging underscore support at trimble.com and it will come to us. Us and we will take care of the care of answering you. And if you have any any questions related to Trimble mobile mapping, feel free to contact us regarding this webinar or not. Uh, still no more questions. I just to add that all our webinars are recording and all, uh, you will get a copy of them afterwards. So don't worry about it. As soon as you have registered, you will have uh, the option to get the copy of the webinar. Yeah. Also, in case you want the slides, I think we can share them. Uh, as a PDF, because we are explaining some methods here and might be not very easy to remember just hearing them once, so feel free to ask. I guess that is all the questions that we have. Okay. We have four more minutes if you have a question you have some time also we have a, we are doing this webinar a second time in the afternoon so if you have some uh, colleagues who are interested in, but could could not make this one you, we are doing it uh, 5 p.m german time so central european summer time so feel free to invite your colleagues as well Chembe, do you have anything to add? Uh, um, maybe Yes, maybe I just have uh, one comment on the separation of the antennas. Um, just, to, just for emphasis, I would like to mention that uh, normally for GAMS, uh, we recommend a minimum separation of um, 1.5 between the secondary and the primary antenna. If this, sorry, this is like the minimum uh, requirement um, that we uh, the, a minimum requirement from us, but basically, Aplanix recommends that um, the separation between the primary and the secondary antenna, if possible, is around two meters. But 1.5 is uh, acceptable too. Just that you know. Yeah, that's good. Good addition. Something we didn't not include in the slides. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Chambi. Uh, another question that we have is uh, if under normal condition or optimal condition using GAMS and DMI will, uh, will be the best initialization mode that you choose. The customer is asking if Giro Compass is the best one or not. Uh, if you have MX9, I would always use Gyro Compassing because the high end I knew. Okay, so I guess this one is a specific question for MX9 user. Yep. Okay, so I guess we are on time. Mm -hmm. And seems to be... Okay, there are some questions that we will contact the customer because we are not sure about what does the question means. So to make sure that we answer in the proper way. So at this point, I will want to thank you again, Johnny, for the presentation. Thank you all your all attendees for being attentive and for your participation with the questions and be uh, looking forward for the next webinar. Thank yeah. you and have a good day. And thanks, Chembe, as well. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. See you all in the next webinar. Yeah. Bye-bye. Hi.